patron saint of pseudo-skeptics, James Randi. Randi is a conjurer, the amazing Randi and showman, who is described on his website as the world's most tireless investigator, and demystifier of paranormal and pseudoscientific claims. He used to be a leading figure in CSICOP, but had to resign because of litigation against him. Carl Sagan, in his sympathetic introduction to Randi's book The Faith Healers, 1987, described him, as an angry man like all pseudo-skeptics, his work as a debunker has attracted lavish funding, and in 1986 he was the recipient of a $286,000 MacArthur Foundation Fellowship. In 1996 he established the James Randi Educational Foundation, JRAF. He has an ambiguous attitude to scientific authority, deferring to it when it supports his beliefs, but rejecting it when it does not. On his website he asserts, authority does not rest with scientists, when emotion, need, and desperation are involved. Scientists are human beings, too, and can be deceived and self-deceived. He is not afraid to attack scientists who take an interest in subjects, like telepathy, like Brian Josephson, professor of physics at Cambridge University. In 2001, on a BBC radio program about Josephson's interest in possible connections between quantum physics and consciousness, Randy said, I think it is the refuge of scoundrels in many aspects for them to turn to something like quantum physics. Josephson has a Nobel Prize in quantum physics. Randy has no scientific credentials. Of his current work, he writes, we, at the JREF are skilled in two directions, we know how people are fooled by others, and we know how people fool themselves. We deal with hard, basic facts. Yet in a review of his book The Supernatural A to Z, The Truth and the Lies, his fellow skeptic Susan Blackmore of CSICOP commented that the book has too many errors to be recommended. Read as profligate lies posing as facts, he has also been shown to invent facts and make up evidence, see here Randy's dishonest claims about dogs. By Rupert Sheldrake The January 2000 issue of Dog World magazine included an article on a possible sixth sense in dogs, which discussed some of my research. In this article Randy was quoted as saying that in relation to canine ESP, we, at the JREF James Randy Educational Foundation have tested these claims. They fail. No details were given of these tests, Randy posing as a scientist, like most online pseudo-skeptics do at the outset, only become unraveled very quickly, revealing their non-knowledge and lies, oh so familiar today. I emailed James Randi to ask for details of this JREF research. He did not reply. He ignored a second request for information too. I then asked members of the JREF Scientific Advisory Board to help me find out more about this claim. They did indeed help by advising Randi to reply. In an email sent on February 6, 2000 he told me that the tests he referred to were not done at the JREF but took place years ago and were informal. They involved two dogs belonging to a friend of his that he observed over a two-week period. All records had been lost. He wrote, I overstated my case for doubting the reality of dog ESP based on the small amount of data I obtained. It was rash and improper of me to do so. Randy also claimed to have debunked one of my experiments with the dog JT, a part of which was shown on television. JT went to the window to wait for his owner when she set off to come home but did not do so before she set off. In Dog World, Randy stated, viewing the entire tape, we see that the dog responded to every car that drove by and to every person who walked by. This is simply not true, and Randy now admits that he has never seen the tape, Rupert Sheldrake. Note flagrant lying by Randy, while he calls Nobel laureate scoundrels. Fraud of this kind is unacceptable within the scientific community, but Randy is no scientist, Randy's stock in trade as a debunker is the offer of a million dollar prize for a demonstration of anti-psychic, supernatural or paranormal ability. But as a leading fellow of CSICOP, Ray Hyman, has pointed out, this prize cannot be taken seriously from a scientific point of view. Scientists don't settle issues with a single test, so even if someone does win a big cash prize in a demonstration, this isn't going to convince anyone. Proof in science happens through replication, not through single experiments. Randy's fellow showman Lloyd Auerbach, president of the Psychic Entertainers Association, is likewise skeptical about this prize, 
and sees it as a stunt of no scientific value. Sheldrake continues, however I was disappointed by the interview with James Randi by skeptic Chris French. Chris began his interview by writing, if skeptics were allowed to have patron saints, James Randi would undoubtedly fill that role. In accordance with his reverential tone, he spared Randi the slightest challenge. But in view of the fact that Chris and I are working together on an experimental investigation of telephone telepathy I wish he had asked Randi about his so-called Pegasus Award for research on this very subject. Here is what Randy wrote about my research in the announcement of the Pegasus Awards, in 2007 category number one, to the scientist, who said, or did the silliest thing related to the supernatural, paranormal or occult, for 2006, it goes to UK biologist Rupert Sheldrake, for his telephone telepathy claims related to morphic resonance. This man has delusions increase as time goes by, and he comes up with sillier ideas every year. Is it silly to investigate apparent telepathy in connection with telephone calls? Several surveys have shown that most people claim to have had telepathic experiences with telephone calls. Experimental research on this subject by myself and others, reported in papers published in peer-reviewed journals, have given statistically significant above chance results, details on my website. Randy is often rude and offensive. Unfortunately many of his fellow skeptics let him get away with it, and treat him with adulation. His presence on the cover of the new look skeptic together with Chris French's uncritical interview, helps to build up this iconic status. Randy may have done a useful job in exposing fraudulent showmen, but he has no scientific credentials, and has made fraudulent claims himself, as in dog telepathy. In Randy's amazing meeting in Las Vegas, in 2005, delegates at the media workshop given by Randy and Michael Shermer were handed a manual called Communicating Skepticism, to the public which told them, how to become a media skeptic, becoming an expert is a pretty simple procedure, tell people you are an expert. After you do that, all you have to do is maintain appearances, and not give them a reason to believe you are not. In real science, becoming an expert requires qualifications and hard work, but as Randy and Shermer pointed out, the rules are different for skeptics. All you need is to form a club with like-minded people. As head of your local skeptic club, you are entitled to call yourself an authority. If your other two members agree to it, you can be the spokesperson too. Randy fuels the widespread public perception of skeptics as negative and dogmatic. Even worse, he makes organized skepticism seem like a fundamentalist crusade with his meetings as revivalist rallies. For skeptics who are genuinely interested in promoting science and reason, he is not an asset but a liability. Pseudo-skeptics take heed. If skeptics want to be taken seriously, then organized skepticism should be subject to the same kinds of quality control as genuine science. Rupert Sheldrake, London and do bear in mind, pseudo-skeptics are well-defined and described in Wikipedia, by skeptic groups, it's a skeptic-invented, word. Even Susan Blackmore, pseudo-skeptic luminary, on the board, denounces the majority of skeptic followers of CSICOP, as pseudo-skeptics, this means you, online randy devotees, mindless antagonists, Hi. I'm a skeptic. Hi. I'm a scientist. Me too. I'm a skeptic. Well, skepticism is only a part of science, not the whole thing. Science is skeptical. It must be skeptical. Are you familiar with the scientific method? Of course. I'm a skeptic. Do you understand that science is a process? As scientists we observe new phenomena. We come up with hypotheses to explain them, and then we put those hypotheses to various tests to see if our explanations really fit, or whether we're just fooling ourselves. That's where skepticism should come in. Then if our hypothesis passes those tests, we call it a theory. That's the end point of our process. A theory is a best fit to the observed phenomena. It's not absolute truth. Science is open-ended, and its conclusions are always provisional and subject to change when new observations or better explanations come along. No. As a skeptic I begin with an existing explanation and go directly to the end point, 
the same existing explanation. It's more definitive. It's also much faster and cheaper, and it doesn't force me to think or to change my mind. Instead of your clumsy process we skeptics use a simpler and more streamlined approach. It's called summary dismissal, and ridicule. It easily disposes of bunk and BS. Now wait a minute. Are you saying that ridicule and dismissal are part of science? Of course. They help us to be dispassionate and objective skeptics. Name calling helps, too. You call yourself a skeptic, but what we really are is a debunker. A skeptic by any other name is still a skeptic. We skeptics are against ridiculous things. We know what's ridiculous and what's not. How do you know what's ridiculous without actually studying it? We skeptics know it when we see it. For example, the whole idea of continental drift is ridiculous. I think you're a little behind the times. Science verified continental drift years ago. That's not possible. The Earth is flat. So what would make continents move? I'm afraid you've got some catching up to do. In any case, the absence of a plausible mechanism does not forbid the existence of a phenomenon. If it did, we would have had no diseases prior to the discovery of microbes, and the sun would have given no light before we became aware of nuclear fusion. We skeptics are very careful in our methodology. We scan the supermarket tabloids microscopically for any articles about weird stuff. When a tabloid publishes something, we know for sure it's ridiculous. I might not know whether weird things, you know, like powered flight and continental drift, are real or not, but as a scientist I would not dismiss either of them unless I'd actually done my homework, read the literature, asked questions, and made up my own mind. We skeptics believe that if you even inquire into weird stuff you must believe it's absolutely true from the get-go. You're gullible. But speaking of powered flight, did you know that it took three years for the scientific American to acknowledge the Wright brothers' first flight? That's an example of prudent scientific journalism. You non-skeptics have no respect for institutional authority. Many scientists today do actually find themselves having to obey institutional authority in order to keep their job, funding and reputation, and avoid ridicule and dismissal. But, in their heart of hearts they wish they could get their freedom back and once again apply their talents to expanding human knowledge and meeting real human needs. I think you non-skeptics are simply superstitious. Superstitions are like rumors that just go around mindlessly from one person to another. It's like a contagion. Many self-described skeptics base their beliefs on such rumors without engaging any of their own critical thinking. I'll bet you believe in crop circles, the Easter Bunny and Santa Claus. We scientists don't confuse reality with fairy tales. Crop circles actually exist, but I have no opinion about them because I haven't researched them. However, I can tell you that aliens exist because I've seen them with my own eyes. You're crazy. I'm out of here. User comments on YouTube, James Randy's devotees, pseudo-skeptics, do much of the mindless mayhem, described here on YouTube and Wikipedia, most YouTube videos enable users to leave comments, and these have attracted attention, for the negative aspects of both their form and content. When Time Magazine, in 2006, praised Web 2.0, for enabling community and collaboration on a scale never seen before it added that YouTube harnesses the stupidity of crowds, pseudo-skeptics, as well as its wisdom. Some of the comments on YouTube make you weep for the future of humanity just for the spelling alone, never mind the obscenity, and the naked hatred 145 The Guardian, in 2009, described users' comments on YouTube as follows, juvenile, aggressive, misspelled, sexist, homophobic, swinging from raging at the content of a video, to providing a pointlessly detailed description followed by a laughing out loud, YouTube comments are a hotbed of infantile debate, and unashamed ignorance, that is pseudo. Skeptics, with the occasional burst of wit shining through, 146 in September 2008, the Daily Telegraph commented that YouTube was notorious for some of the most confrontational and ill-informed comment exchanges on the Internet like pseudo-skeptics, those James Randi devotees, head-picking Christians, and militating against afterlife and the paranormal, their major motivation, sheer bloody-mindedness, like James Randi, their patron saint.